Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Lamorne. Hello. How you doing, Lamorne? Thank you so much for doing this. I'm great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. We've never met, right? I have something that I've self-diagnosed called prosopognosia. The whole fuck is that? <laughs> it's the inability to recognize faces. Oh, good luck in life. <laughs> it's self-diagnosed. Oh. So it could be an excuse. It could be. I mean, I know who you are, so obviously I would know if I met you. So whatever this prognosia the fuck is, doesn't matter. We have never met. Thanks. It's all part of my self-absorption, I think. I wanted to show you this grapefruit I picked. (laughs) (laughs) You picked that? Yeah. What do you think? First of all, I don't know what genetically modified fruit this is, but that shit is on the same shit Barry Bonds was on when he was hitting all those home runs. (laughs) If you saw me yesterday climbing into this tree, like getting my eyes poked out just for this gem, I needed it. (laughs) I needed it. Uh, Would you feel bad eating that now? No. Yeah. I mean, you can spread that throughout the whole family, too. I think it's massive. So, Lamorne, here's what I wanted to start off with us having never met. Mm -hmm. Here are the things that I know about you. Hopefully they're not wrong. Well, there's some basic things. You were on New Girl. I was, yes. And you have your podcast, Unwanted. I do. It's really pretty great. Are you enjoying it? I got to do it from home, which was great. I've done a bunch of cartoons and stuff like that. This one was different because you don't really put on a cartoony like voice. You just imagine you're doing the scene for real. So when I started working with Q Code, I had done a podcast called The Carrier with them with Cynthia Erivo. It was very dramatic and real. And this was their first comedy. And also working with Q-Code, they had this beautiful facility with all these crazy mics that look like skulls. And when you talk to one part of the mic, it's like, that's how the listener would hear it. You know what I mean? Like you're really talking to that person. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I was fascinated by that shit. And I was like, yo, I want to do something with you guys. So me and my buddy Kyle, we created Unwanted. But the pandemic happened and the quarantine happened. So I had to record everything from my house and over Zoom with friends from all over the world having to do it remotely, which made it a little less appealing, but it was still fun. Yeah. Because I just got to like roll out of bed and do it. I was watching some stuff on YouTube and I know that you have a love for Scottie Pippen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know very much about basketball, but I do want to ask you, why Scottie? Yeah. I love a lot of basketball players. Some of them are obscure. There's like Quentin Richardson. He's just a Chicago native. I love a lot, of, a lot of Chicago basketball players that happen to go pro. Some of them didn't go pro, like Lance Williams. You wouldn't know who these people are. No, I wouldn't. No. But my brother loves Scottie Pippen as well. Mm-hmm. And I think you're either a pure basketball fan because he was so skilled And is it a little bit of the underappreciation of him? Yes, I think that's what it is. First of all, very underappreciated, underrated, because he was playing alongside Michael Jordan. But what people weren't thinking about was, so Michael Jordan would lead the Bulls in scoring, but Scottie Pippen would lead them in every other category. You know, assists, rebounds, blocks, steals. He was just that dude, that good of a secondary player, so much so that he almost won MVP the following year when Michael Jordan retired. So it was like he could lead his own team. He's still the man. Like he's still Scotty Pippen. And nobody really appreciated him. And another reason why I like Scotty Pippen so much is because I think, I don't know how this is going to come across. I'm partly a hater. Like Michael Jordan was my favorite player growing up, but now LeBron James is my favorite player. And because of those comparisons, I always say, well, Michael Jordan has Scottie Pippen next to him. LeBron leads this team in every category. So that's why I think he's the greatest player of all time. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And in terms of leadership within a team, Mm -hmm. who do you think has the strongest element in terms of bringing a team together? LeBron. Oh, my God. That's not even close. I think like when you watch The Last Dance, Michael Jordan was like cursing people out, like having sex with your wife. Michael Jordan was crazy. (laughs) It's like, I'm Michael Jordan. I can do whatever I want. I'm going to raise your kids if I feel like it. Like, that's how (laughs) dominant Michael Jordan was. And I think people didn't like him. But like LeBron kind of gets along with everybody. Every team he goes to wins a championship. So I think that kind of says a lot, you know? He turns players into all-stars who have no business being on the all-star team. Yeah. So, yeah, I think LeBron definitely. And he loves to pass the ball. So players, when they come in the league, they want to score. And LeBron's like, great, here's the ball. And simultaneously, he can still lead his team in scoring while doing it. That's why he's the GOAT. I love that. All right. Well, here's what I wanted to ask you, though, as well. Another sports-related question, which I don't know too much about. (laughs) But 
In an attempt to get you to self-describe a little bit, if you were on a baseball team, mm -hmm. what position fits you? Left out. Oh, why? Because I don't know how to play. Let me tell you something. That shit is difficult. I used to think that I could play baseball, but my hand-eye coordination, something about it. I'll give you a story. So JaVel McGee is an NBA player. He won a championship with the Lakers last year. I think he's in Denver now. But he has this charity called Jug Life. It's to promote like kids to stay active and drink water, and then they build water wells in different parts of the world and stuff like that. So he has this charity softball game. So I'm playing in this charity softball game. It's like a lot of people there, like a lot. Oh, uh, this sounds like my nightmare. Yeah, oh my God. Don't ever say, yeah, I will be there if you don't know how to play. I wanted to go in support and I should have just been left out. But I was like, nah, I'm going to play. And warming up, crushing the ball. I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. Now everyone's watching and you got Terrell Owens. <laughs> Terrell Owens, former NFL player who is just so angry when he's playing. <laughs> this is a nightmare for me. <laughs> Yo, and he's so competitive. He's so competitive. And I remember he had hit a double. So he's waiting to come in. And now I'm at bat. So all I got to do is hit the ball. Oh, shit. And I'm telling you, I am striking out. Like I'm hitting. And it got to the point where because I made it kind of hilarious. I was doing a bit at the thing. So they were like, OK, we're going to give him 10 <laughs> strikes. He, don't, he doesn't get three. He gets 10. <laughs> and I missed the ball every single time. And you got throw Owens waiting. He goes, get the fucking ball, man. <laughs> he's so mad. I'm like, bro, it's for the damn kids. OK. Like, stop. I'm not going pro. You've already been pro. Relax. You know, so that was my nightmare. So I can't play baseball. I would definitely say I would be left out. OK, I want to talk with you about auditioning. Mm -hmm. I've heard the stories, the intense auditioning experience of New Girl and how you were up for two projects at the same time. Mm -hmm. In what ways do you think the auditioning process is different from the actual filming process? Well, one, when you film, you're not in front of a white wall with a bunch of people staring at you, you know, like doing this one person thing while the reader is kind of dead inside and they've read with a hundred people and they don't really care to be there. And all they want to do is drink a coffee or go the fuck home. And then you're sitting there, hey guys, I'm shooting Snickers on camera. Like, you know, so right. here's what I do. I have a different audition process. I booked this movie Bloodshot with Vin Diesel based off of the way I put myself on tape for it. And when I made to come audition, I didn't want to. I said, I'll put myself on tape. But I shot the audition like an actual scene. I had a crew. I had a camera guy. I had another actor playing Vin's character. And I shot it that way because that puts me in a space where I can actually perform. And I feel like there's things that I can do. There's things that I can touch. Their props. I can imagine the world around me as opposed to being in front of a white wall or a curtain. Because when you're acting, you don't really have to be that imaginative with the space, you know, so that takes some pressure off of you. But when you're in the space, it helps you. So I'm not in the business of auditioning. I'm in the business of acting. But I imagine you're really good at auditioning. I am, but I hate it. It's my nightmare. The pressure of sitting there, I just can't do it because it's hit or miss. You never know what people are looking for. All you can do is give them the best version of what you want to do. And it's up in the air after that. But the reason why I believe that with you is because you started out booking commercials with a degree of frequency. And that is a hard thing. Yeah. Commercials are so incredibly specific what they're looking for. It's usually not very imaginative mm -hmm. in terms of performance. Right. So to book them with a degree of consistency means that you're an excellent auditioner in my mind. <laughs> well, you know, I used to tell friends of mine who were trying to get in the business and trying to book work that it's not necessarily about what you think they are looking for. is just about doing what you want to do, what you're really good at. Because if five guys walk in a room that look like me, the only difference is they're taller and better looking. Let's say we all have the same degree of acting and we read the script and we go, let's do exactly what the character says and what I think they want. They're going to go with the taller motherfucker with abs. I don't have those things. So I'm like, I could make shit up and I could be weird and I could do this thing. So at least you have one outlier here and then you have these cookie cutter people. You could go with either one. But I know I'm standing by myself in that position of an option. I realized that when I was late for a commercial audition, my car had been repoed. I was taking the bus from like North Hollywood oh. all the way to Santa Monica. Oh, God. So like three hours and 43 minutes. You've done it. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> You've done the trick. So, yeah, it's like you would get there. You would go three hours, 43 minutes. You get out. You walk inside. You sign in. And then you would go, mm, I love Oreos. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, thank you guys. And then you walk back outside, you go that bus, you know, four hours back. So I was late for an audition once for a Miller Lite commercial. And they were like, hey, did you read the sides? And I was like, yeah. I didn't read a damn thing. <laughs> and then I walked in and usually they'll have like these big ass sides that are right behind the camera for you. And so I walk in, I just look at it for the first time, like, the fuck is this? I was like, it's a lot of words. <laughs> and so I improvised. I just made stuff up. And then they booked me on the spot. And then from there, I would get calls from the casting director like, hey, can you come in and do this audition? But like, throw the script away. They want you to just improvise. And it was almost like it was a new foreign idea to them. Like, oh, people can improvise in commercials. And that's what I started doing. So the rest of my commercials that I would book, some of them were just straight offers just because they were like, that's the guy who can improvise. And I was like, if they only knew that all of us can. (laughs) (laughs) Don't tell them, Lamar. I didn't want to tell them. But I was like, there's a place called Groundlings out here and UCB. All those people are great. But I won't say a word. I'll just keep working. I love that. Hey, Lamar, what was your first boss like? My first boss was an interesting fella. I worked at a place called Hollywood Video in Chicago, and he used to fuck. (laughs) That's what he would do. He would just fuck? (laughs) It was like he couldn't do it at home. So he would do it at Hollywood Video in the office. Who's he fucking in the office? His girlfriends. It was always someone different. How is he such a player? I don't know. He was 18. Oh, my God. He was the boss. He would come in, and he would toss me the keys, and he would go in the break room slash office, and a girl would walk in. Hey, I'm like, hey. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe this is his girlfriend. But then that girl would change. I don't know if they would break up or whatever. But he would go in the back, and it's a clear glass window. Oh, my God. So what he would do is he would try to, like, stack up tapes, like VHS tapes and DVDs, so I couldn't see in the window. And I'm at the register, like, cashing people out and, like, sending people home with their DVDs of Austin Powers and shit. And then I'm looking over, and he's in there doing it often. Like, at least once or twice a week, this would happen. (laughs) (laughs) So that's how my boss was at Hollywood Video. Would he brag about it? Nope. One, he would act like it wasn't happening. (laughs) First of all, we can hear you, not her. We can hear you for sure. Like, you're loud. And, like, you could see it. It was, like, very clear. It was clear as day. Sometimes he wouldn't put the tapes up. So you would just see things happening in the room. Did you like that job? I did because it was easy. And I used to give all my friends free movies. And so when I didn't feel like doing any math, what I would do is you could go in people's accounts and give them free credits for movies. And people would come up and, you know, if they were nice enough, I would just be like, hi, go, hey, oh my God, it looks like you have three free movies on your account. Oh, and you have three movies in your hand. That's amazing. They're like, really? Why do I have three movies? I have no idea. It's in your account right now. And I would do it often. You just liked bringing (laughs) joy to people at the expense of Hollywood video. Yeah, I think I crippled the company. (laughs) I'm the reason why VHS and DVD is expired and extinct. What has been your least favorite non-Hollywood job? I used to wait tables for quite a while. Yeah. One of my least favorites was this place called Famous Dave's, this barbecue place that I used to work at. I worked at some pretty cool places, but this was my least favorite because I think there was something wrong with the kitchen, like the sewage in the kitchen. Oh, God. It just smelled like shit. Like, it would smell like straight up feces. Oh. It was almost like every cook took turns blowing the bathroom up and would leave the door open. It was just disgusting. There's already a very distinct smell of, like, the dishwashing. Yes. Like, there's that very restauranty kitchen smell of, like, yeah. old dish water. 100%. That already kind of clings to your clothes a little bit. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine having the sewage element on top of that. Oh, yeah. And it was always the backup and the sewage and then the bathroom. So it was a triple threat of just shit on top of shit on top of shit. Okay, you don't have to answer this, but are you in a relationship currently? No, I am not. I am currently single and I'm in these streets. Okay. Have you had a series of long-term relationships? Like, are you kind of a monogamy person or have you had a couple of year-long relationships here and there and single most of the time? Yeah, I don't plan anything or label my ability or inability to be monogamous. (laughs) I don't cheat. You know, everybody knows black men don't cheat. That's a real thing. I don't cheat at all, but like I've been in some two-year relationships, some three-year relationships, some six-month relationships. You know, life kind of comes at you fast sometimes and you have to exit stage left if you need to. Sure. I'm not one to date around. You know what I mean? Like I don't have like three girls that I'm dating at the same time or anything like that. Or when I say dating, I mean, you know, go on a couple dates here. Maybe you share a coffee in the morning. 
There's not multiple people drinking coffee at my house in a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like your boss. Right, not like my boss. I mean, his libido. Strong. But, Lamorne, would you prefer to be in a relationship, do you think? Or are you pretty content? Oh, my God. I would love to be in a relationship that I could be in. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have these moods and these modes that it's just your life doesn't call for it at that time. But when I'm in one that I enjoy, I'm in one. You try to make it work as best as you can until Prince shows up, (laughs) R.I.P. Or until Tyrese shows up or one of these dudes that steals your girlfriend. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, have you had your heart broken? Quite a few times. Really? Oh, yeah. And it goes back to like high school days. Have you broken somebody's heart? Every day. That's my life. Yeah. That's my life. (laughs) I guess I have, but it's not intentional. When I get out of a relationship, I definitely want to remain friends with that person to kind of lessen the blow. But also, I enjoy that person in my life. I'm not in a relationship for one particular reason. Usually, I'm in a relationship because I genuinely like hanging out with that person. And I'm also attracted to that person. And so, when you lose something, the one thing that never goes away is that wanting to be friends with that person. And have you been successful in that? I think that that's a tricky thing sometimes, of course. I have. I have been successful. I'm friends with a few exes. A couple of them, no. A couple of them, definitely not able to remain friends, especially because I don't think their husbands would like it. Uh, But, you know, I would love to remain friends. It's like you spend years developing a bond with a person and because the relationship didn't work out, it's almost like you're dead to me now. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Are you the kind of person who sort of romanticizes the past, like the one that got away? Yeah, I think I am. I could be in a relationship that ended tragically, like terribly, like she cheated on me or whatever it may have been or something crazy happened. But then like a year down the line, I'm like, man, I should have made that work. Oh, and then I remind myself, no, dog, no, that would have been a bad idea. Yeah. Memory. I always talk about how it sharpens in terms of your most emotional association with it, Mm -hmm. but it gets really blurry with detail. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Lamorne, I have a game coming out called Deal Breakers. Oh, snap. Yeah. Do you tend to make assumptions about people early on? It depends on those assumptions. Are we talking relationship-wise or just in general? Let me give you a little context. So this game came about Deal Breakers because we used to play this on the podcast. But before that, I had a list of men in professions one should never date. Okay. It was like magicians, mm-hmm. yeah. musicians, Oof. professional athletes, chefs. Oh, wow. That is a roster. Okay. I still haven't really dated all that much and I'm now engaged. I've been married twice. Third time's the charm. <laughs> we should unpack that too. I'm not sure if you've unpacked that already. Oh, I haven't. No. Okay. Yeah, we got to unpack that. Today? Right now? We can if you want to. We can play a game first, but at some point we're coming back to the three amigos. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So I'm going to give you a series of potential deal breakers. Yep. Let's assume that this is your first date. Okay. Number one, they are waiting for marriage before having sex. Is that a deal breaker for you? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Should I expand? Yes, please. (laughs) Well, you know, I got to see what's happening. And I want to make sure you see what's happening with me. You know, what if we just don't vibe sexually at all? What if I have two penises? You never know. What if both of them didn't work? Well, Medusa head. <laughs> yeah. Just a bunch of heads going on down there with no activity. That is bad. Bad news for anybody. Their fridge is full of expired food. That's not a deal breaker. That just means they like to go out and eat. I get it. Might not last very long because it also means that they can't cook. And I can, but I don't want to be doing all the cooking. Yeah. I just don't want to. You got to at least know how to make one dish, one go-to meal I'm down for. I have a lot of expired food in my fridge. Third time's the charm. Again, we got to unpack it. Somebody likes it. (laughs) Part of me feels like I was raised during the Great Depression or something. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I do feel like there's a little bit of wiggle room with certain items in terms of their expiration. Me too. Like almond milk, you know, at the end of the day, this comes from almonds, right? It can't be that bad. So I got some old almond milk in my fridge. All right, Lamorne. They use the 10 items or less line with 15 items. Ooh, it's not a deal breaker, but we got to talk. There's certain rules you got to abide by. Certain ones that are just appropriate. Like you got to be considerate of everybody who's only got 10 or nine. There's somebody who's running there real quick. They want to grab Gatorade and they want to get the F out. Yeah. 
And then here you are, and I'm with you, and you're like, but it's only five more items. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. If we didn't know each other and I was in line, I'd be pissed at you. You know, there's a whole other line for that. I'm so with you. I get anxiety when, like, small rules are broken. Yeah. For some reason, I seem to be okay with breaking bigger rules. Yeah, like, I'll break some rules here. Like, I might smoke weed on an airplane. I might do it. You know, nobody's going to know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you learned they posted an Instagram photo of your first date during the date. Deal breaker. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not big on people posting so much. I've had to, you know, in relationships where it felt like, you got to post this. Or how come you don't post enough? And I'm like, God damn, this sucks. But now I'm very particular about people posting me. You know, I just don't want everybody to know where I am yeah. and what I'm doing and who I'm doing it with. You know, they have four cats. Four cats? That's what the card says, Lamorne. God damn, they got four cats? Oh my god. If they had one, I'd be like, cool. If they had two, I'd be like, I get it. That first cat's lonely as hell. But four cats? I mean, you lonely as hell. And I'm not trying to come in and fill that void. That is a deal breaker. All right. <laughs> they mention that everyone always tells them they should model. <laughs> 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 oh my god if i think she should model then it's not a deal breaker if i don't think she should model and she always mentions it no that's a deal breaker at some point and this is all first date stuff this card says first date there are other scenarios yeah that's a deal breaker i might see how far it goes because also sometimes you're just trying to do some weird stuff that night yeah that's true it'll be like all right she thinks she's a model and that's cool and we get along today i know we wouldn't get along in the long run because i can't keep putting out those dreams for her <laughs> <laughs> maybe it ain't gonna work out i just want you to know this, this is not in the cards for you they take change out of a fountain to feed the meter deal breaker really why are you kidding me i don't know who gets this change if anybody's gonna get this change it should be somebody homeless who just kind of hangs around that fountain and they're like ain't nobody gonna use this i can eat a sandwich with this you feed the meter <clears throat> girl you got a job shit get your credit card out Unless it's one of those old school meters that only takes coins still. And they're being incredibly resourceful. I mean, maybe, but nah, that's a deal breaker. They only order from the children's menu. That's not a deal breaker. I understand that. You don't want to eat that much food. And in America, we eat a lot. Our plates are massive. You go to other countries, they eat smaller portions, you know. But what if it's not about portion size? What if it's about, I want the chicken fingers again? Do they not have chicken fingers on the adult menu? No. And when you go to the restaurant, they're like, do you have a children's menu? I'd like that. Ooh, <laughs> ooh. It's not a deal breaker. I've been on dates. I've had some girlfriends that are like, oh, I'm just going to order from the kids menu. And I'm like, cool. One, cheaper for daddy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely cheaper for me. So yeah, not a deal breaker. We can get married off that. <laughs> They dated your close friend. Oh, God. Unfortunately, that used to be a deal breaker for me. It all depends on how my friend feels. That's a mature answer. Yeah. If my friend is not cool with it, then it's not going to happen. Okay. They do stand-up comedy as a hobby and use you for material. If it's not funny, they got to go. You can use me all day if it's funny. I don't care what you say. As long as you're on stage getting laughs and you're making <laughs> your dreams come true, go for it. <laughs> yeah. But if it's not funny, I'm like, you are just ruining your life <laughs> at my expense. Their bed consists of a mattress on the floor. Deal breaker. Oh, boy. Well, that's another story for off camera. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I love it, Lamorne, that you envision that maybe all of your exes listen to this podcast. Oh, first of all, there's a couple of things. Y'all be titling these podcasts Lamorne. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you were so right. 100%. Yes. I'm like, no, no, not going to talk about it. Yeah. I done that. Yeah. Somebody who's still thinking about you is going to be like, click. You're talking about me again? Shit. Okay, Lauren, what or who has influenced your career the most? I would probably say Second City, Chicago. It's big up there for me. That was my first time I got a sense of a community of people trying to do what I'm doing. And people funnier than me, people I can like look to and pull from and perform with. You know, those Second City days, I would just say the improv scene in Chicago overall, like I had some pretty cool folks that I got to be friends with. TJ Miller is a buddy of mine, and he was like a big influence for me just because I saw how daring he was. Yes. He's a crazy person. But I was just like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's somebody who's just big and he can do it and he's fine with it and, you know, has its ups and its downs for sure. But it let me know, like, you got to be brave and just go for it. 
And I was thinking about the idea of like being brave in the world of comedy. (laughs) But I think that there's something to do with the courage of being able to project your own weird vision of the world Mm -hmm. through your lens and have that be translatable to an audience. Would you say that that's like part of whatever it is that is being courageous? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I come from like two different backgrounds. Like I was raised in the South Side of Chicago, then I moved to the Burbs. And so I saw the world in two completely different landscapes, but I never really wanted to like dive into being fully there with it. You know what I mean? Like I have two different lenses on how I view the world and I never just spoke about it or I never just appreciated it or talked about it. So I was kind of like a low, nervous, shy performer when I knew I had all these things to pull from. But then you start seeing performers just go for it and gun it on stage and talk about their lives and do all these things. And you go, man, I have like this wealth of information behind me. I should probably just like be appreciative of it and just perform and just play. Yeah. It's more of like struggling with sort of the idea of what makes people laugh. And I do think it is the idea of familiarity and relatability Mm -hmm. through avenues of creativity. 100%. I remember watching Chappelle for the first time. I mean, he's my favorite all time, like numero uno. And I remember just watching him speak. Like I would watch certain comics speak. I would watch Comic View a lot. A lot of old black comics sound very similar. And then Chappelle had a very different tone in his delivery. Mm -hmm. He would speak about where he was from and people accepted it. And I was like, oh, man, you can be left of center as well if that's who you are. And then there's a whole mess of people who appreciate it and new fans who don't come from where you come from, who love to kind of step outside of their own neighborhoods and their communities and see how you're living over here. 100 percent. Yeah. He's one of those people that I first recognize what you're talking about in. He was so daring. And now he just gets on stage and just has a conversation with people from his perspective. And he's a guru in that. People want to hear what he has to think. Where before people would be like, man, that motherfucker's corny. But then now it's like, yo, he's the greatest. Yeah, he's unbelievably brilliant. Have you ever written a fan letter? Ooh, I think I have. Does it count if it was on MySpace? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I wrote to Louis C.K. once. Because he is responsible for Pootie Tang, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. (laughs) And I remember writing like this thing to him and then he responded. This is years ago. And Pootie Tang's catchphrase was like, Sarate. (gasps) Have you seen Pootie Tang? No, I'm embarrassed. Do I have to see it now? You have to see it. I'm shocked you weren't in it. For some reason, while I was saying it, I was like, I think she may have been in it. But Pootie Tag is one of the dumbest movies of all time. Like, it's so stupid, but I love it. I should have been in it. (laughs) It's in that very slapsticky world. It's Chris Rock and like J.B. Smoove. And, you know, it's just pure joy. There is no storyline, really. It's so silly. And he doesn't speak words. He'll just say these things like, I'm a sign your pity on a runny kind. Oh, God, I love that kind of shit. <laughs> and you're like, what is he saying? And so Louis C.K. responded to me with Sarate. <gasps> and I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world, man. So, yeah, I wrote Louis C.K. once. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Osea. Female founded over 25 years ago by a mother and daughter team, Osea were pioneers in creating clean beauty products that are good for your skin and the planet. Using sustainably sourced plant-derived ingredients, Osea's nutrient-dense formulas give you the results you want, skin that looks and feels amazing. And in addition to award-winning cleansers, serums, and face moisturizers, Osea also creates incredible body products like their now famous Andaria Algae Body Oil. If you've always preferred body lotion over oil, get ready to have your mind changed. Andaria Body Oil soaks in quickly, isn't greasy, and leaves your skin glowing. If my experience is any indication, you can count on frequent compliments from your partner about how soft your skin feels. Osea's products are clean, vegan, cruelty-free, climate neutral, and created with sustainably sourced seaweed. So not only does your skin feel good, you can feel good about what you're putting on your skin. Experience your new favorite clean skincare line with a special discount just for unqualified listeners. Get 10% off your first order with promo code ANA at oseamalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order, 
And orders over $50 get free shipping. You're going to want it all. Go to O-S-E-A Malibu.com. Use code Anna. Well, I was going to ask you if you have a favorite movie that you could watch over and over. The Matrix, for sure. The Matrix is my favorite movie of all time. Are you prone to a little conspiracy element in your life? Yes. It makes me so happy to know that potentially there's nefarious things going on in the background. I'm like, yes, that's so cool if it's true. When I hear about these like weird secret societies and people talk about like simulation theory and things like that, I'm like, oh my God, that'd be so great if I was a video game character and I didn't know it. Oh, it'd be amazing. But I would love to know it. I would have to know it. I'm big on that. Obviously, I saw The Matrix when it came out. So it was a while ago. And I was thinking that way even back then. I was like, oh my God, what if we are living in a simulation? This is pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) So when Elon Musk talks about simulation theory, I'm all ears. When he talks about anything else, I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. Let's get back to the simulation theory. (laughs) But Lamorne, will you explain to me what that is? So simulation theory is the idea that we essentially are living in pretty much the matrix. Like there is some sort of higher being. We're not talking God, but we're talking like maybe more intelligent beings that are far more advanced and are ahead in the future than we think. And we are merely some sort of program that we're kind of doing things in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, like The Sims, essentially. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to think that we were being observed Mm -hmm. by another community somewhere out there Mm -hmm. as sort of what not to do. Oh, yes. (laughs) You see what they're doing? Mm -mm. That's not the way, buddy. (laughs) As though like these parental alien figures that had created our universe to teach their offspring life lessons. Oh, yeah. A thousand percent. And I think you were on to something. I think you were. Again, look at all these books behind you. You ain't dumb. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. It was the only way I could kind of like make sense of our collective behavior sometimes. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we're obviously very tribal and communal people. We learn from the masses around us. Yes, but getting back to the idea of tribal and community, when you watch LeBron, Mm -hmm. any team that you feel passionately about, do you ever get annoyed that your emotions may be affected by a win or a loss? Yes. I don't know why that is. I don't know why I'm mad and sad that a dude who I don't know, who's worth a billion dollars and married his high school sweetheart and has a great family and has won all these awards. Why am I mad that they lost the game? Like, let that man live his life. I think the main reason why I'm affected by it is because of bragging rights with friends, bets, and things like that. LeBron's the greatest, but then he'll lose a game. Like, see, I told you, he's trash. And I'm like, fuck. These are arguments that I enjoy having. These are debates that I love. Yeah, the financial element will definitely create an emotional response. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you're a degenerate gambler, absolutely. Your wife would leave you in a heartbeat. <laughs> so what's the second movie? Training Day. Oh, yeah. I have posters of these movies in my house. Denzel Washington is my favorite actor of all time. And that monologue in Training Day that he had at the end, I mean, the guy won an Oscar for this movie. Like, he's so good in it. Him, Ethan Hawke, the whole cast, they're just absolutely firing on all cylinders. Like, they're so good in this movie. And it was the first time we've kind of seen Denzel step out of that leading man heroic character and turned into leading man villain, which was like, whoa, that's pretty dark. So it was fun to see. You're right. And that movie in particular, it's packed with scenes of such high intensity. Oh, yeah. Mostly like dialogue. Oh, yeah. And it had some thriller elements, too, because certain parts of the movie, you didn't know if he was turning over a new leaf. You didn't know if he's really just trying to train this guy. You didn't know if this was all a big game. You don't know what to expect because, again, it's Denzel. So you're like, he's got to have a redeeming quality, right? Completely. Okay. What was the best advice you've ever been given? I've gotten all kinds of advice from folks in life. But the best advice I've ever gotten did not necessarily pertain to me. It was just something that I heard once and it was always wiped from front to back. (laughs) And I just thought, yeah, you know, that makes sense. (gasps) And I've gotten so much mileage out of it because people ask me for advice. And that's the only thing I can think of. When people say, hey, Lamar, I'm like, you got any advice for like a young actor? It's covered up. I go, hey, always wipe from front to back. Got to do that. You got to start there. And so that would probably be my favorite. 
I was told by an old, bitter, broke actor in Seattle where I grew up. Mm -hmm. He was like, listen, kid, if you can do anything else, do it. (laughs) And that rolled around in my head for a long time. Like, okay, if I have passion or find joy in other elements, does that mean I am not tormented enough? And I came to the conclusion that no, I'm the kind of person who takes comfort in the idea of enjoying other things because the rejection that we face is daily. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that way at all? Like if acting were to become illegal, how would you make a living? Well, this is the first time I'm mentioning this out loud. I am retiring from acting. So I have some obligations. I will keep doing my show, my series Woke, which is on Hulu, streaming everywhere right now. But my goal is to become Adam Sandler. He's so got it. You know what I mean? Like he does what he likes to do. He involves his friends, his family, and everything that he does. And he controls his own schedule. You know, he's not having to jump through hoops to get a job, to get paid. He's just like, I'm in my own lane. And so I want to be that. And the only way to do that is if I focus more on things that actually aren't acting, more creative, more building. When I say retiring, I mean, I'm stepping away from other people's projects and only focusing on mine and what me and my friends are doing. And then get back into it eventually at some point. But I definitely want to focus on things that matter to me more because it's just like you said, I personally couldn't find real hobbies. I find myself consumed with the idea of performing and getting the next job and building something and creating this. And I'm like, man, I just spend so much time thinking about this. I need vacations. I need time to rest my brain. I need time to spend with my family. And to have a degree of control over your own destiny. Exactly. The gatekeepers sometimes make me sick. Yeah. yeah. Completely. I mean, that was why I got to a point in my career around age 27 where the realization of like the roles that I would like to play aren't out there. So development felt like my only option. Right. 100%. You have to do it because if you spend most of your time thinking about what somebody else wrote or what somebody else created or what somebody else is directing, you put all of your ambitions and the things that you really want to do on the back burner and then you'll regret it later. So you never know. I mean, it might not work out. It might not happen, but at least you can say you gave it a shot and you tried to create your own reality for yourself. A lot of people don't have the luxury of doing that, but I challenge those folks to create the luxury of doing it yeah. and take a chance on yourself. If you can't take a chance on yourself, how do you expect anybody else to? That's great advice. Yeah, that's my advice that I gave to myself. Yeah. So I give myself the best advice. <laughs> <laughs> if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? I mean, a lot of people probably pick some exotic place. You had Adam Devine on once. I think he said like Italy or something, which is fucking awesome. I would just go back to Chicago. If I could be amongst people that love me the most, like I have friends in New York that love me, I have friends here in LA and family here in LA that love me, but mostly all those folks that do are in Chicago. So I would rather be where my mom is and my sister, my nieces, my aunts, uncles, cousins, you know, old childhood friends. Like if I could live the way I wanted to live and bring that to Chicago and just have the ultimate freedom, I'd probably do it in Chicago. If you could generalize sort of the vibe of Chicago, Mm -hmm. what kind of summation would you give it? Chicago is just genuine. It's a very, like, real and honest place. I don't know any pretentious people, really. Like in L.A., we're overcome by it. You know, it's the business we work in, obviously. You become this person sometimes that you didn't necessarily want to be, but you kind of have to be in this business a little bit. But in Chicago, like people will keep you honest. You know what I mean? And also, they're not over it, though. They do appreciate what you do. They're not like, man, that's bullshit. Fuck that. They're like, no, that's great. Yeah, right, right. That is congrats, bro. Congrats. You still ain't shit, but congrats, man. That's amazing. (laughs) You know, and let's get back to doing what normal folks do. Yeah. Even the nightlife scene in Chicago, which I genuinely enjoy because, again, it's not a pretentious scene. It's just like a bunch of people trying to go out and have a drink. And they're like, well, everyone come inside. (laughs) You know what I mean? Let's not do this whole, who do you know? Uh, I don't know you. And, uh, you know, like these weird gatekeepers. I just like, I just want to get an old fashioned man <laughs> trying to find my wife. <laughs> Let me find my wife. <laughs> Let me be great tonight, man. <laughs> I'm wearing pants, damn it. <laughs> Come on. I love that. Lamorne, what personality traits did you inherit from your parents? Humor from my mother, for sure. My mom is funny. Yeah, you know, I should tell this story about how she used to prank phone call me. It was so weird. (laughs) That is awesome. Yeah, she would do it, but she would do it like when I was there at home with her. And she wouldn't block her phone number. She would go, hello. 
<laughs> I'd be like, uh, what's up, mom? And she's like, how do you know it's me? I'm so going to do this to my son. I love this. <laughs> yeah. I wish he would have called you at Hollywood Video, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That would have been the best. <laughs> and then, you know, I used to get in trouble at church a lot for acting up and being silly. And uh, one of the older ladies, my mom used to always like pinch my leg and go, stop it, stop it. And then the old lady next to her once was like, oh, Gwen, you know, you was the exact same way when you were younger. She's like, don't tell him that. <laughs> he doesn't need to know that. You know, mom did theater coming up and she writes poems. And, you know, I got the creative and humorous side definitely from my mom. Are you a fan of comics like the Marvel Universe, DC? Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. Indeed. My favorite is Gambit. He was like this card playing guy who do card tricks and throw cards. I really shouldn't ask questions when I don't understand. Where were you going with the question? That's the <laughs> Well, because what I do appreciate about the comic book world is complexity of character. And I love like the heroes with flaws and like which character evokes a passion or like a draw in certain people. You know, I would probably say like Wolverine would probably be that character because Wolverine comes from like this dark past. He's got all these demons. But when the wrong thing is happening in front of him, he's like, I don't want to have to like slice these fools up. But like, I guess I got it. I guess I got to slice these fools up. You know, a while back, I saw Hugh Jackman's screen test. It's pretty amazing. Really? It's pretty fantastic. Oh, crap. I got to take a look at it. There's also a comic called Bloodshot, which I think all the fans out there should go and take a look at it. It's one of the greatest comic books of all time. In fact, there's a movie out called Bloodshot that I think people should go on demand and just look at, you know, watch the movie. I mean, all the characters in there are absolutely fantastic and multi-layered. And, you know, it's the greatest comic movie of all time. It's called Bloodshot. It's everywhere. Go check it out, guys. I'm going to. <laughs> and then I'll take a minor character, attempt to develop it and pitch it to you in like three weeks. You should. If we do the sequel, you should totally be in it. That would be my dream. Don't act like you don't know me when I call them. Be like, hey, you down to do this movie? And don't go, who is this? Oh, God. <laughs> Lamar wants me to do this movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What would your younger self not believe about your life today? That I made it in a way. But here's the thing. Part of you maybe isn't surprised. There is a part of me that in the back of my mind, I always felt confident that I wouldn't struggle much financially. Like when you're in high school, you're taught, okay, you have to know where you're going to college. You have to know what your major is going to be, what your minor is going to be. You have to take these aptitude tests to determine where you're going to go, who you're going to be, all these things. And I never cared for those things. I just knew. And at the time, I thought I was going to play basketball. So I was like, oh, I don't need to know this stuff. I'm going to play professional basketball. Who cares? Right. But then those were clearly delusions of grandeur because I wasn't that good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in hindsight, I look back and go, dog, you are not that great. Right. But I knew I could perform and I didn't truly know how it was going to manifest itself into what, but it happened. And coming from where I come from, it's not something that we see often. You know what I mean? Like coming from the South side of Chicago, it's not like you could tell folks, hey, I'm going to have my own TV show one day. Right, right. You know, and you watch people in movies, you know, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I'm here having a conversation with you. And I like watch all your movies. You know what I'm saying? This is not something you could tell somebody who's from Chicago, like, yo, you're going to be doing this and being interviewed and having conversations with folks that are so dope on TV and in film. I wouldn't have thought that, you know, I just wouldn't have. I didn't know the avenue. I didn't know the way. I didn't know where to even begin. And the avenue was so different for everybody. I mean, I'm sure when you get asked like, hey, how do I get famous? Right. There's no easy answer. It's like, get a sex <laughs> tape, bruh. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I say the worst. I always say that. Do community theater. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that answer. Yeah, they don't want to know about the actual <laughs> struggle, though. Because I did community theater. Right. Like, they don't want to know. You got to grind. Yeah. You got to grind it out. I've done more free work than paid work in my life, you know? Yeah. Lamorne, what intimidates you? Whew. Besides maybe charity baseball games. <laughs> Besides <laughs> Terrell Owens, <laughs> what intimidates me? Directors who are way too serious that don't have a sense of humor. I can't handle it. I don't care. We could be doing the darkest movie of all time. But if you got to look me in my soul every single time you're giving me a note, I'm going to vomit. <laughs> like, I can't. It's like, stop being so intense. We play for a living. Let's make it feel that way. 
Yeah, I think if I can't logically apply a note. <laughs> yeah. like, is it me? Yeah. Am I the dumb one or is he just making some bullshit up? Right, yeah. yeah. You know, like I'm not the brightest person. So every once in a while, a director would come and give me a note. And in that quick note, there may be four or five big words that I don't understand. So I absolutely don't know what the <laughs> fuck you're talking about. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll yeah. just, uh, cool, cool. And you do it and you walk back and you go, was that what you were trying to say? Right. And then they never hire you again. <laughs> so what advice would you give to young women when it comes to relationships in that world? We slept together. Should I call him? His name is Lamorne. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will call you back. I've just been busy. I changed <laughs> phone numbers dm me on instagram i'll give you my new information lamorne i love how this podcast has sort of been framed by your potential exes listening to it <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm a good guy, I swear. It's kind of awesome, but it also makes me incredibly curious. Yeah. And I'll let you know if we get any feedback. I will say a lot of times, and I found this to be true when I give advice to women friends of mine who are in the same position, I go, why is the ball in his court? You're automatically putting yourself at a disadvantage by saying, what does he want? You got to start by figuring out what you want first. And if that person's not on the same page with you, you can either be patient and wait for that person to catch up or you got to keep it moving. You're not going to change a person like that much. People have this hero complex. I'm the one who got him. I'm the one who made him calm down from his hoish ways. It's not going to happen that way all the time. So if that person's on the same page with you, yeah. and love is not 50-50, love is not equal. It's not going to be at the same level all the time, and there's going to be some compromise there. So that compromise, I would say, is allowing that person to grow into getting to want to see you. And also distance. When a person blows your phone up often and is like, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? You're going to think, one, that person's crazy. But two, that person's just going to be there whenever you need them to be. So you take it for granted and you don't show that person the proper attention that they deserve. If you give that person space, you'll find that you'll come together at some point, I think, when you naturally, organically make it happen. I don't think you should rush that process. Anything worth having, you work at it. And I think the working in this instance is time. I think that's incredible advice. Okay, do you have a favorite joke? I do. I can tell the joke in two minutes or I can tell the joke in an hour. I've done it both ways. Oh my God. It's one of those really extended jokes. I'll tell the quick version. There's a husband and wife. They had a baby, right? They go to the doctor and the wife, she's got the belly and, and the doctor's like, what seems to be the problem? She goes, what the fuck does it look like? I'm pregnant. And he's like, okay, cool. So what's going on? Are you in labor? She's like, yes, motherfucker, I'm in labor. And he's like, oh shit, okay. Well, push, push. And she's like, okay, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. They push, push, push. The husband's like, oh, baby, keep pushing. She's like, motherfucker, that's what I'm doing. I'm pushing. Why is everybody up my ass? And she's like, finally pushing and pushing and pushing. And she hears a... <laughs> And then she looks down, he's like, the baby out? He's like, yeah, baby's here. But the baby was just a head. The baby was literally just a head. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so his whole life, he had a weird life. This baby he was just a head. So when he grew up, he was on the basketball team, but he was the basketball, you know, it was weird. So one day his dad was like, hey, when you turn 16, I'm going to get you drunk because that's the legal drinking age, right? <laughs> it's like, yep, sure is, dad. So one day he rolls off the bus. His dad picks him up and puts him in the back of his car, you know, to watch out for blind spots and shit. They got one of those old cars without the cameras, the side. Sure, sure. So he puts him on the back of the car. He gets to the bar. He puts him on the bar. He says, Johnny, give my son a shot of whiskey. It's today is his 16th birthday. And he said, yeah, this makes absolutely perfect sense. Nothing wrong with this. I'm going to give him a shot. So he drinks a shot and the kid grows a spine. And he's like, oh, shit. What the fuck is going on? And he's like, oh, maybe if I give him another shot, he'll grow an arm. And he does. He grows a left arm. Then he grows a right arm. He grows a penis. It's bigger than his dad's. His dad's a little ashamed, but he's like, fuck it. I have a real boy here. A real boy. A real boy. At this point, the news cameras are around. People are talking about it on Instagram. The boy who was once ahead is now almost a full boy. He's got one more shot to go, and then he's going to grow a right leg, and he's going to become a real 16-year-old boy with real 16-year-old boy-like experiences. So he gives him one more shot, and the suspense is now on IG Live. They got 150 million viewers, and he gives him a shot. And that little boy dies. That's it. He ain't coming back. R.I.P. He's making R.I.P. t-shirts and shit. You know, that's it. <laughs> well, there's a moral to the story. What? <laughs> you should always quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
That's my favorite joke. But more, if you can't sleep at night, I want you to record the hour-long version of this. <laughs> yes, I can do it in two hours. <laughs> I was imagining the father carrying the head around in a bowling bag. That could be a good one. I could add that to the story, too. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't roll away on, like, slopes. I feel like you just sort of red-pilled me or something. I have so many jokes like that. <laughs> the friends are like, what the fuck is he <gasps> talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and then the ending is very non-satisfactory. <laughs> I bet in the hour-long version, it is. Yeah, people are engaged. I once did it at a party, <laughs> and everyone was like standing around and going like, oh, shit, this is a great story. It's leading to one big joke. <laughs> and sometimes I'll end it with the little boy dies, and I'll like walk out of the room. <laughs> and then people are like, what the fuck? And then I'll come back in later. He should have quit while he was ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. Hey, Lamorne, thank you so much. Thank you. And in all seriousness, I would love to, like, talk to you about some ideas. Yeah, for sure. I love your idea of, like, doing this on your own. I feel like I've tried to have that mentality for a while because you have to. Absolutely. I mean, no one's going to do it for you. And we have the cachet already. People know who we are. People know what we're capable of doing. Let's put our heads together and create stuff for us and our families and our friends. You know, why not? All right. I'm going to be bugging you. Please do. Hey, Lamorne, thank you. Thank you again so, so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, of course, of course. You take it easy. All right. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Peace. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Intuit, powering products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, and Credit Karma. Intuit works for what you work for. And because I've been using QuickBooks for years, I've been working with Intuit for years. I just didn't know it. I've also recently begun using Mint, which, as everyone else also probably already knew, is an easy way to create monthly budgets. With Intuit, artificial intelligence does everything from predicting your future cash flow to recognizing a misplaced digit in an account or routing number. You can also categorize and track personal or business expenses by scanning receipts, invoices, and other financial documents. Everything is automatically organized, especially helpful if organization isn't your greatest talent. And smart budgeting tools let you know before you overspend. Innovative features like these make managing your finances simple, but as you probably already knew, innovation is at the core of everything Intuit does. Discover how Intuit's products can help you see what's possible at Intuit.com. That's I-N-T-U-I-T dot com. Hey, everyone. April Buyer is back now officially as my much needed co-host. As you know from previous episodes, April brings great advice, insight, and years of experience. I am so thrilled to have her. All right, April, let's call Jocelyn. Hey, Jocelyn, this is April Byer. She is fantastic. She's my new co-host for this segment. And she knows a lot more than I do. Hi. Yeah, I have been listening to April on the podcast with you guys. That was like one of the reasons encouraged me to write you. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. Nice to meet you, Jocelyn. Nice to meet you too. Will you tell us what's going on? Yeah. I wanted to like write this down. So hopefully I'm not too like rambly or whatever, but I'll try to make it succinct and to the point. So my husband, I met like five years ago, we met like really organically, like playing pool with friends and just really hit it off. And it was just a great relationship. And we just fell in love and it was awesome. And we moved pretty quickly. We ended up eloping within like six months of meeting. And yeah, I have no complaints. We have two babies. He's a really great dad. The only thing that's sort of been kind of a hang up with us is that sometimes I think like sexually, we're not as compatible as I would like. When we met, he was a bit like less experienced, I would say, and definitely like lacking some confidence. And he is just such a wonderful person. I was like happy to like hold his hand through some of that like confidence stuff and like try out positions and kind of build his confidence. And then it, it like got better and it was fine. I mean, we have like Irish twins. Our babies are 15 months apart. So we're busy and we're very much like in the trenches. So I feel like, you know, my body has been through a lot and he's changed a lot. 
From your letter, you mentioned that like it's your sex life that has been a harder element in your relationship lately. And you've moved, which is crazy during this time. And you have two little kids. Yeah, two little babies. And it sounds like from your letter that your husband is, like most people, sensitive about the topic being brought up. Yeah. How frequently do you guys have sex now? I feel like we have sex fairly often. I just don't think it's like as fun for me as much as I would like. <laughs> like, I think we have sex at least once or twice a week, maybe more. I think that's pretty good. From what I hear, that's actually good when you've got a couple of little babies. Yeah. <laughs> like, who's getting any sleep when you're sleep deprived? You know, a lot has changed. I think what we should ask is, how was it before you got pregnant? Because you guys haven't been together that long. Yeah, we really haven't. I mean, like I said, in the very beginning, it was really tough. Like, he had a hard time, like, keeping an erection he would kind of get nervous or he would come like really quickly and then like eventually just with like patience and just trying a lot of new things like it was fine and then even after my daughter was born I mean actually I think that was some of the best sex we ever had I don't know if it was like my hormones or what and then like we had another baby like it was a bit of a surprise but obviously it was a little too good <laughs> yeah girl <laughs> so I was so lucky in that regard for real because I had like a tough labor with both of them and I was just like I mean I had a hard time waiting six weeks with my first kid I don't know it's weird but compared to my girlfriends I feel like it's a little different you know sometimes it's really great sometimes we'll just go through these cycles where I feel like even after all this time, I know it hasn't been that long, but almost five years, like he doesn't like know when I've come. He doesn't like know really like he'd be like, oh yeah, you came, right? And I'd be like, well, how do you still asking me that? It get frustrated. <laughs> it's not that you want more sex. You want better sex. Yeah. And does he have an inkling of that? Yeah. I've like tried to be like, oh, okay, well, let's try it this way next time or something. So he knows. And then unfortunately, and I think it's just because like I'm not getting enough sleep and I like all of a sudden don't have a support system like with my babies. It's a pandemic and I'm in like, I went from Maine to Oklahoma. So it's like a culture shock. Whoa. It's a lot. Recently, I've been just like, oh man, I don't want to take care of another thing. Like, can you just take care of me? I feel like I'm doing everything. I just want in that one area of my life to be like more taken care of, you know? Yeah. Okay. So it's a lot to unpack. I know. <laughs> well, because on one hand, I love it that you guys are having sex so frequently for having two young kids. I think that's awesome. I do wonder though, Jocelyn, maybe I'm totally off on this, but is the sex conversation also part of the larger picture, which is like, oh my God, the dishes, the laundry, the kids, I need more, I want more out of life. Like, I wonder if you're sort of channeling some of the other frustration in life into this element. Am I totally off? I could be. No, not at all. I mean, that sounds like about right. It's very hard for me not to like cascade when there's like an issue. Like all of a sudden I'm like, I don't even want to be here. It's like you forgot to put the cups away. And I'm like, I don't even want to live in Oklahoma. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just, it like rock piles like really quickly. When you kind of explode like that, does he take the bait and engage with you or does he tend to like, I'm going to the garage? Yeah, he tends to just kind of like hope it all like get better <laughs> on its own. <laughs> right. Also, just everything else is not helping, you know, it's like I'm just kind of like at this like borderline frustration level. Well, I think it's interesting that in the beginning, Jocelyn, you use words like I was holding his hand. I cared about him. He was so nice. I walked him through this confidence issue. And so you became teacher. And what happens when you have a baby or babies in your case is that now you're so focused on being mom that it's watering down your chemistry with him because now he's now become in your head, he's become another dependent, another responsibility because you feel, or maybe it's true, that you still have to shepherd him through this kind of come on in, the water's warm and building his confidence and giving him strength. And so something has to shift there before you even think about what's wrong in the sex department because perhaps he's grown since then and you're still in that mommy mode of him and that never works in a marriage for him or you yeah he probably can't articulate that he probably doesn't even know how to put that into words but that's a lot that's going on right now that's a good point that sounds like pretty true <laughs> and remember you chose the guy that needed nurturing in that confidence department and a lot of women think well if i nurture him through this and i protect him and i teach him 
I'll get him to a place of possible manhood or strength or confidence or whatever that is. It's very rare that all of a sudden you create this powerful person, right? The guy that was insecure and lacked experience is still in there. But you saying, hey, let's try this and try that, you're still leading. Instead of really going into your most vulnerable space of, I don't know if you're hearing me. What I think is going on is there's not enough communication. There's not enough listening on either side. You're missing care. It's why you're saying we moved across from Maine, we moved to another state, and I've lost my support system. Your husband should be your support system, right? He needs to be your co-pilot. But that wasn't the setup of the relationship to begin with. So you've got to massively shift your dynamic here. How does she do that? First of all, it's trusting him more to pick up the ball. If there's laundry to be done and he's not doing it or he's not doing it for you in bed or something is needed with the kids and he just goes out to the garage, whatever is necessary for those kids, do it. But anything else, just say, I would love your help in this. I need this from you. Can you please help me? Empower him. Give him confidence through not holding his hand and babying him, which is also like really defeating for a guy. Empower him. Make him feel bold and confident by what he does for you. And when he does do something, just praise the crap out of him. Thank you so much for picking up the ball in the kitchen. And thank you so much for this because you're still being the cheerleader. Let's try this position. Let's do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you're feeling alone and you've sort of piled him into all of your responsibilities. And that's why you're not having good sex. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. <laughs> I think that's so smart. I want to hear more about the kind of dialogue that Jocelyn should use, because I think we do get into patterns of being like, oh, my God, why am I always the one? Like, we can't stop ourselves from the push away dialogue. Ooh, I love that. Like, how do we ask someone for help instead of pushing them away? Well, first, Anna, I love that you said push away language. We're all so guilty of it. And I think we have to be aware of who were we when we first attracted that partner? So you guys met in a bar. It was fun. You, you were saying earlier you were carefree. All I know is that when we first attract our partner, and I'm talking first 30 minutes, first hour of how, of how they witness us, that's what they're attracted to. So then if you go into like what Anna said, which is the chaos and the push away language, when you're stressed, it's harder to come toward you. It's harder to care for us when we're like that as women if we've attracted men who found us in our strength. This is all making so much sense, right? It's like whenever I am like wacky stressed around my husband, I don't get touched. I don't get hugged. I, and you would think that in the moment of the world is burning down and all the stress and the chaos and my freaking out, you would think that I would get like arms around me. It's the exact opposite. So instead of me trying to convince him like, hey, love me when the, you know, everything's crazy, calm me down. I have to nurture myself and calm myself down. So I think, you know, we should talk about him and you should definitely like just medically get him checked out, see if everything's good there. But before you do all that, there's a few steps to do. So first and foremost, you got to quiet down your chaos and get back into the driver's seat of your life. You've got a lot of responsibilities right now. And even though you moved a few states away, your support network is still there. With the pandemic, everybody left cities now that they know that they can work remote. And so a lot of people left their communities and their support networks, but we're all still there. We can get on Zoom. We can get on phone calls with one another. So whenever you're feeling that, uh, get your oxygen mask on first. Every day, call one of those people from your hometown where you were living in Maine. And every day, call someone different and literally just do a 10-minute call of, I need support right now. I need advice right now. So that you are consistently plugging in, nurturing yourself in that way through community. So now you can take that off your plate. Don't wait two weeks to talk to them. As far as your husband goes, I would actually write down today exactly what you need him to do. Let's just drop the sex for a second. What do you need him to do that would make your day better so that you feel stronger, sexier, more empowered? You mentioned in your letter that you feel like a caretaker and there's nothing sexy about being a caretaker. So yeah. what do you need right now? Like say three things you need right now that we could help you with, that you could have the language to go to him today and get some things back just to quiet all the nerves and the chaos. 
What are three things that would be helpful? Um, sleep, <laughs> like him figuring out how to like wake up with kids, you know, more equally. So I don't feel just like so tired all the time. I don't know, like maybe like more ownership of like the mundane household stuff, like always being the meal planner and then nobody eats your food. It's like, hmm. I just got to go jump off a bridge. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Jocelyn, you're so funny. And I hope it reassures you on what, on a weird level that so many people are hopefully going to listen to this and they're just going to be right there with you. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Yes. Everybody feels this way. Do you love him? Jocelyn? Yes, I do. Can you imagine a life without him? No. Okay, then let's get busy making your marriage amazing. You're in a rough patch right now. It's totally understandable. You've taken a huge move. You've got two human beings in your life that you are caring for. You're away from friends and you don't have a husband who knows how to kind of step in and co-pilot with you right now. But what does he do for a living? He teaches technicians around America how to like fix and maintain radar systems for airports. Perfect. Okay. So he's, he teaches. So you got to tap into the way his brain works. So he knows how to put like a syllabus together and he knows how to instruct and train and teach. So go to him with logical steps because that's what he's going to respond to. He's not going to quickly and easily respond to emotion. That's why he ditches out to the garage. But he will respond to logic and he's in tech. So you got to use the other side of the brain. Gosh, when I was developing my, my company, talking to my engineers, I thought I was going to pull my hair out because I didn't know how to speak engineer. I learned, but I still didn't get great at it. <laughs> yeah. And what I find interesting is the three things you just said, we actually didn't talk about sex, which was the reason for you calling us today. We actually talked about sleep ownership of household activities. And then you said, I don't know, a nanny. So that tells us you're just needing some support. You want to be seen. You want to be heard. You want to be respected and cherished. You cooking a meal and then the kids don't eat. And then he doesn't like it or doesn't eat. And then you're left with the dishes. Of course, you're going to be frustrated and angry. And trust me, there's no way you're being sexual and sensual and even attractive if you're feeling that. So you got to stop this now. And it's what a lot of women go through. I think when they first have kids is this sort of division of duties that does impact the sex life at home. Resentment and exhaustion do not make for great sex. Absolutely. You know, the other day, my husband created some kind of spreadsheet for me for business. It kind of just blew my mind because I could never figure out how to do something like this with all the numbers. And I looked at him and I said, thank you so much for what you've just done. It really is amazing. And I couldn't do any of this without you. And he goes, okay, okay. And I said, no, no, really, it's amazing. And I said, and later on, you are going to get a big thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he got a big smile on his face and whatever we were arguing about that day went completely away. So first you have to figure out love languages, right? What's his love language? What makes him inspired when he does do stuff for you? What does he love to do for you and around the house, right? So figure that out. Yeah. I mean, he's great with the kids. I hear a lot of my girlfriends be like, oh, you know, before I can go to like a doctor's appointment, I have to like prepare their meals and stuff. And I don't have to do that. Like he's, he knows how to like make our kids food. He knows how to like clean them up and like take good care of them. Like I don't have to like hold his hand through being a dad. He just has like a job where he's gone a lot. So I'm just like alone a lot. And I think that's kind of where I need so much from him when he's around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Chris Rock had a routine about like, let me get my foot in the door, woman, right? So when somebody comes home from work and you've been alone all day, it could be six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, the impetus is to immediately grab onto them of like, oh, thank God you're here. Here's a kid. Here's a kid. Go do that, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I like throw him a baby. <laughs> throw him a baby. Okay. So do something where make sure like weekends, right? That he does that stuff. But during the week, give him one hour to get in the door and take care of him for that hour, right? Just for that first hour, say, what do you need to kind of segue into home life with us? And then agree that he gets an hour to kind of unwind and unpack and get out of his brain and get home. And then after that, the agreement is, okay, what would really help me is if you give the kids a bath and you put them to bed. You have to have division of labor here and you have to start speaking up and not yelling about what you want, but like saying to him, I need more sleep. 
But should she phrase it like hour here, hour there? Like, how do people respond to actual sort of like a routine like that? What I'm getting the sense of is his brain would really respond to that. And it's also going to respond to empowering him with, you are so good with the kids. What I've been doing is I'm alone all day long. I don't have my physical support system, my friends and family to come over and help me. And what I've been doing is I've been throwing you a kid right when you walk in the door because I need you because you're so good at it. And when you walk in, I feel such a sense of relief. But clearly that doesn't work for us. And I feel like there's too much push pull. So can we agree that when you get home, you have an hour to shower, work out, unwind, sit in front of the TV, listen to music, whatever that is, I'll prep dinner. But what I need you to do and my request is that you then bathe the kids after dinner or whatever your routine is and you get them to bed. And on the weekends, I would very much love it and be so thankful and filled with gratitude if you could get up in the morning so that at least a couple days a week, I'm just getting to sleep in. Because when I sleep, honey, I'm a better person. And when I'm a better person, I'm happier. And when I'm happier, I'm sexier. And I'm going to want to be with you more. So tie it back to the sex so that he knows that there's a reward for doing this. And you're empowering him with, can you help me with this? Instead of do the dishes, take a kid, get up at four when they wake up in the night. Just say, what would really help me is this. When you get somebody's involvement in something, especially with a guy, and you can speak to them that way, they actually, because they love you, and I know he loves you, you actually make him want to do these things for you. Could you help me with this, babe? Here's what I need. I would love it if, use those kinds of words instead of the others, which Anna said so beautifully. What did you call it, Anna? You said push away language? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was great. Thanks, April. <laughs> <laughs> the win <wind> today. <laughs> She's totally right. It's, it's, it, otherwise, it's push away language and nobody wants to do anything for us. And I think, too, like as we talk to our partners about these things that in the past have like culminated in maybe not arguments for you, but definitely tension. In the past, if he said things like, I get up early, too, you know, I have to go to work like I go to work every day. He does understand logically that you are working every day, but he doesn't understand the difference in child rearing all day long and going to a job all day long. They're both fucking exhausting and stressful. But one is the tidal wave of neediness. Maybe you could say to him, baby, I know you work your ass off. I know you are at work all day long. On the weekends, though, I could really use just a small break from this particular kind of exhaustion and stress. And if you can put on the pot of coffee and get up with the kids and I can just like lounge in a dreamy state for an hour, you can then fill in the blank of what you'll do for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think we get into patterns of a dialogue of demanding. That does sound a lot like me. You know, I get mad and, and he's not like a confrontation guy and he's kind of just like, hmm. And like, sometimes I feel like he's like, I don't want to make her mad. And then I'm like, ah, just do yeah. this forever, you know? So it's, it's definitely like a communication thing. And then you're like, but why aren't you making sweet love to me? <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, be the man. He's He's like, like, you yell at me all day. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Jocelyn, you know what's missing is your vulnerability. You know, like what you're sharing with us today, if you could tap into that, go into your softest, most feminine power. Think of like, how can you elicit a response? Because what I'm hearing is you just don't feel seen and heard and you don't feel respected and you don't feel cherished. And that's because you're not communicating enough in this other way. You feel like you're communicating, but what you're doing more is you're just getting angry and reactive. And what we're asking you to do is get smart and get proactive here. He loves you. You love him. You have a good marriage. Like, let's solve this first, right? And then your sex life will probably have a shift to it out of all of this. And if it doesn't, then you guys should go into deeper discussions about what is going on there. The root is he never had a lot of experience before you. Emotionally, sexually, you might have been one of his first partners. So there's a lot of teaching that's been going on and you're just tired. 
you know, my parents used to meet in the laundry room when there was three of us running around all, you know, 20 months apart, like meet me in the laundry room, five minutes, like that's all they could get in. <laughs> right. I know. I feel like we only have sex in the playroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, God. <laughs> We're so tired at night and then in the morning we always wake up like with a start because someone's like screaming, you know. So it's like nap time. And we'll just like go in the playroom because it's like the quietest room in the house. And I'm like, I'm getting a little sick of like playroom sex. Oh <laughs> I guess that's our only option, which is good, but it's something. Yeah, exactly. See, you're laughing. You're laughing, which means you're you're fine. You know, it's like your letter sounded like you were in big trouble. And I think that there is an issue here. But what I love about stuff like this is that it's a sign that something is up and it needs to be remedied. But it doesn't mean that your life is over, that your marriage is over. You're just going through a phase right now. It's a big one. We don't want to make light of it. Imagine this is a tunnel and you're going to come out the other side and you're going to have a stronger marriage as a result. A lot of couples go through this and they never, ever talk about it. They sweep it under the rug and then inevitably somebody leaves, somebody cheats, whatever. This is your golden opportunity. Instead of being sad that this is going on and angry, be grateful. Be like, yes, okay. You know, the writing's on the wall. We know what's missing here. Instead of blaming him, I'm not communicating effectively to speak into his listening. And when you own your own responsibility, Jocelyn, it's not like saying I'm at fault. It's saying I'm so powerful as a woman. I can do this. I can change this. I can make this so much better and brighter. As simple as it sounds, I never really thought of being like more soft and more feminine. I always just like, I don't know what it is, but I, I have kind of approached things as like more of like a rough and gruff and kind of grumpy sort of way. And like, I'm always like a big, like happy to always use your feminine wiles where you can, you know? So that's like, a, I never thought of it that way. It's like a, a really nice point. So yeah, Jocelyn, I think we found your path. I think so too. I never thought of that that way. I think that's going to be really helpful. Remember, Find out what inspires him. Look at your husband. Find out like when he does things for others, his family, his siblings, his whatever, his people that he works with, when he gets juiced and excited and he's in that sense of accomplishment, what is pushing that? Think about that, especially at work, right? So it seems like he's confident at work and he's less confident in relationship. So figure out the things that make him confident there and bring those into your dialogue right? At work, he's teaching. Nobody is bossing him. He is leading and teaching, right? So stop teaching and leading him. Put him in the position like, honey, can you figure out a way for this to happen? Or when the dogs are barking and I've just sat down for a second and the dogs have to go out, can you figure out a way that we can get them on a schedule? Put him in teacher mode, put him in leadership, and he'll start doing things for you left and right. <laughs> Can you figure out a way to tie me to the bed, <laughs> ravage me, and then just leave me tied up for a couple of days? <laughs> and let me get like 10 hours of sleep after. Could you figure that out? <laughs> She's not wrong. Carry this into the bedroom too, right? You're bossing him too much. You're being mother, parent, director, teacher, and you've got to stop that right now unless you want to continue this life the way you're leading it. And trust me, it, it gets worse. There gets to be a point in relationships where everything kind of just dies. And it's because nobody was brave enough to take a U-turn and go, okay, this isn't working. Let's shift behavior here. April, I love your point that he is a leader. He probably has a lot of patience with the people he's training. He's probably really good at it. And of course, like most humans, Jocelyn, he's not thinking about the chaos that you're experiencing. He knows that it's happening, but it's not preoccupying his mind. Just like probably you're not thinking about how his role is at work because we're all supposed to be present. April, I thought that was so wise that he is kind of respected at work and a leader and at home, it's a different scenario. But Jocelyn, the thing that made me so happy is how much you love him and how much it seems like you guys love each other. And that just made my day. So you got to think about the feminine empowerment and the encouragement, giving him respect and making him feel leadership that's going to make him want to ravage you right? Telling guys what to do disempowers them. Making it look like it's his idea is very empowering. And then what you do is you layer on the wig and the costume and you do the play and you do all that crazy cool stuff that spices up your love life because you're going to need to. You got two little kids that need you, right? 
So focus has to be there, but this is first before you start doing all of that. I know it doesn't sound sexy and fun. I don't know. There's something kind of like putting on like the gold digger charm. Like, oh my God, you're so brave. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) you're so brave. I really think it's figuring out a way to get him to work through process without you telling him what to do. Give him a a mathematical equation to figure out and unpack. Honey, this is what's going on. Can you help me figure this out? Babe, is there any way that you can blank on a Saturday or Sunday so that I can blank? You know, he's great with the kids. Let him do play dates on Saturdays or Sundays where he's got those kids for four hours. In the meantime, you're home taking a bubble bath, putting on your makeup, your wig, you know, getting super hot and sexy. So when he comes home, he feels alive because he's with his family and he's not coming off of work. You feel great. You'll find that he'll want to do more of the things that make you natural, relaxed, happy, sensual, sexual. He'll go, wait, what happened to you? You're like, well, I had some time off. Ooh, look at you. You're so alive. You're so sexy. Well, I got sleep. Yeah. His brain will start to do all the things that give you what you want if he gets to see the end result. It's like reverse engineering it. And it's not manipulative, by the way. It's just human behavior. Yeah. But April, that particular idea takes patience and a little bit of like an ego check. It is like sort of giving the gift before it's been earned, I suppose. But I think it's really wise, and it is the good long game. Yeah, thank you for saying that. It's a long game, so don't get frustrated because you get quickly agitated with him, Jocelyn. But you also have to write down household duties and like put it down on paper what you need him to do at night so that you guys have a schedule. He likes to follow protocol, right? Wasn't he in the military? Yeah. Okay. Military people follow protocol. Give him that and work on it together. So this week or one of these nights when you're not stressed, sit down together and work on that schedule. And some people say you actually actually even have to schedule your sex life when the kids are little. I think I was thinking about it like different than what you're saying, because he's always like, I'm a Marine. I'm good at taking orders. So like the bossy lady in me kind of like took that and ran. <laughs> Like, I kind of thought, I why well, he's too good at taking orders. I got to boss him around. <laughs> but I never thought of, like, letting him be the boss would, like, empower him. And that's, like, an interesting way. Like, that's something I definitely want to try. Because yeah. I've always just been like, yeah, he's good at following orders. Here's some orders, you know? <laughs> yeah, but my assistant married somebody who is former military. And he's very empowered. And it's funny because he has a job similar to your husband's. And at home, they have a division of labor. They're trying to have their family right now, but he's very alpha, very strong in the marriage, of course, wants her opinion. They're just powerful together. So yes, military people follow direction and they follow rules. It's just within them, but that's at work. We're talking about what is going to help him in a marriage. Yeah. Jocelyn, you're hysterical. You're strong. You're smart. I'm really excited to see if changing the pattern will give your love life hopefully the spice that you guys have been missing. And I got to say, though, you guys are doing great for having two little ones. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> People are going to get mad, Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like we do okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be fine, Jocelyn. You're going to be better than fine because, as Anna said, you're so strong. And look at you. We can tell that you're a happy person and you love this guy. You don't even have to worry or concern yourself with throwing in the towel. Ease up on that. Let's not catastrophize everything. You have a good man in your life. You have two beautiful children. You've got a couple of crazy dogs. You have a new home, a new surrounding. Take this on as your new wonderful opportunity and challenge in your life because this is your opportunity for massive growth not only in your marriage, but in your own growth as a woman. And we're so excited for you. I love that. Well, listen, will you please be in touch? And thank you so much for writing. Thank you. April, you are a genius, as always. I've learned so much from you. I really do. Thank you so much. Great to be here. <laughs> 